Why don't we get started? Of course, this is a, a moment where many of us have been uh, waiting for. This is the, our policy panel in the annual research conference. And the theme for this policy panel is uh, a theme that is going to resonate with, with all of us, of course, monetary policy challenges in a uh, global economy. Now, we, as we all know, in recent years, the global economy has been going through a major inflationary episode. Pretty much every country, everywhere, with a few exceptions, have seen inflation rates that they had not seen in many decades. Uh, this has been accompanied by a number of uh, additional shocks as well. A war on the European continent, an energy crisis, rising trade, geopolitical tensions. And of course, uh, in response to this surge in inflation, central banks in many, many uh, places have uh, tighten monetary policy also to uh, an unprecedented degree in, in a long, long time, um, including in the US, but in, in many other places as well. Now, the good news is inflation is on a downward path in, in many places, even though it remains still quite high and above desired levels. And um, many central banks now appear to be near or at the peak of their hiking cycles, so they are communicated uh, about that. Uh, so while we're not home yet, it is an important time, important time to, to take stock. And this panel will uh, aim to shed some light on the trade-offs and the challenges that policymakers face today. Um, has the monetary policy response been sufficient? Has it been effective? What can we say about spillovers? And more broadly, is uh, the central bank toolkit uh, fit for the task at the current juncture? Now, to help us think about some of these very complicated issues. We have a really phenomenal panel today. I really cannot think of a set of people who would be more qualified to share their views on, on these questions. And so I'm going to introduce them briefly in the order in which they will speak. We'll start with first with uh, Jay Powell. We're very fortunate to have Jay with us. Jay is uh, chair of the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve System since 2018. Arguably, many would say, the most powerful policymaker in the world. Uh, he served as a member <laughs> of the Board of Governors since 2012. Uh, prior to the Federal Reserve Board, Jay worked in investment banking. He also served as Under Secretary of uh, Treasury for Domestic Finance in a George W. Bush, each uh, Bush administration. Um, Amir Yaron uh, has been Governor of the Bank of Israel since 2018. That is for almost as long as Jay's ch tenure as uh, Chairman uh, of the Fed. Uh, before that, Amir was professor of banking and finance at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's a world-renowned expert in macroeconomics, monetary economics, finance, and uh, financial economics, and we're particularly delighted to have Amir with us today. Uh, Gita Gopinath uh, requires no introductions, I think, especially in these walls. But she is the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Previously, Gita had my job as chief economist and head of the research department. And prior to joining the IMF, she was the John Swanstra Professor of International Studies and of Economics at Harvard University's uh, with uh, a world-class record of research on exchange rates, trade, and investment, international financial crisis, monetary policy, debt, emerging cri market crisis, uh, a very, very long and distinguished list. And then uh, last but obviously not least, uh, Ken Rogoff. Ken is uh, the motivation for this year's annual research conference in his honor. And we are very happy to have him uh, today and tomorrow. And currently, the Moritz Boas professor at Harvard University, also a former chief economist at the IMF in 2001-2003. Another turbulent time uh, uh, for the global economy. Uh, Ken has written several extremely influential books and, of course, many, many research articles on debt and financial crisis. He has written what remains to this day a reference uh, textbook, uh, graduate textbook in international macroeconomics with, with Ken Rogoff in 1996. Um, is known for his, with Maury Upsfeld in 1996, <laughs> is uh, known for his uh, pioneering work on exchange rates, central bank independence, sovereign debt, financial crisis, among uh, many uh, other topics. And Ken 
as long ranked among the most cited economists. I, I checked quickly, and I think his RIPEC ranking, which is something uh, us for academics or former academics, we, we check carefully very often. I think his RIPEC ranking is number 11, which is totally astonishing. And his uh, Google Scholar count is, you know, off the charts, astronomical. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, I have to all mention this, Ken is also an international uh, chess grandmaster. Now, we will start uh, with short interventions uh, from each of the panelists for about 10, 12 minutes, followed by uh, a quick discussion between them, and then we will open uh, uh, for discussion with the audience. There are mics in the aisles. If you are at the point at which we reached that stage in the panel, if you want to ask a question, please line up behind uh, the mics, and then you will have a chance to do that. I will only ask that uh, since our time is counted, that you keep your questions brief, and you also keep them focused on the topic of the panel, which is monetary policy challenges for the global uh, economy. Now, with this, let's start with Jay. Um, I believe Jay will talk about the nature of the inflation process in the U.S. and the appropriateness of the monetary policy response. It's up to you, Jay. Thank you very much, Pierre Olivier. It's, uh, it's great to be here, particularly in honor of Ken, whom we're, we're proud to count as a member of the Fed family. Um, so my assigned topic is uh, U.S. monetary policy in the current global inflation episode. So I'll begin by briefly addressing the U.S. outlook, and then I'll turn to three broader questions raised by the historic events of the pandemic era. So to begin, U.S. inflation has come down over the past year, but remains well above our 2% target. My colleagues and I are, of course, gratified by this progress, but we expect that the process of getting inflation sustainably down to 2% has a long way to go. Uh, the labor market remains tight, although improvements uh, in labor supply and a gradual easing in demand continue to move it into better balance. GDP growth in the third quarter was quite strong, but like most forecasters, we do expect growth to moderate in coming quarters. Of course, that remains to be seen, and we are attentive to the risk that stronger growth could undermine further progress in restoring balance to the labor market and in bringing inflation down, which could warrant a response from monetary policy. The FOMC is committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. We are not confident that we've achieved such a stance. We know that ongoing progress toward our 2% goal is not assured. Inflation has given us a few head fakes along the way. If it becomes appropriate to tighten policy further, we will not hesitate to do so. We will continue to move carefully, however, allowing us to address both the risk of being misled by a few good months of data and the risk of over-tightening. We're making decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity, inflation, and inflation, as well as the balance of risks as we determine the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time. And we'll keep at it until the job is done. So with that, let me turn to the three questions uh, that I've posed that ar have arisen from the receding but still elevated inflation we're experiencing today. The first question is, with the benefit of two and a half years to look back, what we can say about the initial causes and ongoing policy implement implement implications of the current inflation. After running below our 2% target over the first year of the pandemic, core PCE inflation rose sharply in March 21. Economic forecasters generally did not see this coming as shown by the February 21 survey of professional forecasters, which showed core PCE running at or below target over the subsequent three years. So the real-time policy questions for policymakers were what caused the high inflation and how policy should react. And at the outset, many forecasters and analysts, including FOMC participants, viewed the sudden upturn in inflation as mostly a function of pandemic-related shifts in the composition of demand, a disruption of supply chains, and a sharp decline in labor supply. The resulting supply and demand imbalances led to large increases in the prices of a range of items most directly affected by the pandemic, especially goods. In this view, as the pandemic abated, our dynamic and flexible economy was likely to adapt fairly quickly. Supply disruptions and shortages would diminish, 
Labor supply would rebound, aided by the arrival of vaccines and the reopening of schools. Elevated demand for goods would shift back to services. Inflation would ease reasonably quickly without the need for significant policy response. Indeed, although monthly core PCE inflation spiked in March and April of 21, beginning in May, it declined for five consecutive months, providing some support for this view. But, of course, in the fourth quarter of 21, the data clearly changed amid waves of new COVID-19 variants, with only gradual process in restoring global supply chains and relatively few workers rejoining the labor force. That lack of progress, combined with very strong demand from households, contributed to a tight economy and a historically tight labor market and more persistent high inflation. The committee signaled a change in our policy approach and financial conditions began to tighten. Of course, a new shock arrived in February of 22 when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, driving up prices of energy and other commodity prices. By the time we lifted off in March, it was clear that bringing down inflation would depend both on the unwinding of the unprecedented pandemic-related demand and supply distortions and on our tightening of monetary policy, which would slow the growth of aggregate demand, allow supply time to catch up. Today, these two processes are working together to bring inflation down. The FOMC has raised the federal funds rate target by five and a quarter percentage points, and we've reduced our securities holdings by more than a trillion dollars. Monetary policy is in restrictive territory and putting downward pressure on demand and inflation. The unwinding of pandemic-related supply and demand distortions is playing an important role in the decline in inflation. For example, wage growth has steadily fallen since mid-2022 by most measures, despite continued robust job gains, reflecting a resurgence in labor supply, thanks both to higher labor force participation and a return of immigration to pre-pandemic levels. While the broader supply recovery continues, it's not clear how much more will be achieved by additional supply side improvements. Going forward, it may be that a greater share of the progress in reducing inflation will have to come from tight monetary policy, restraining the growth, growth of aggregate demand. Turning then to my second question, for many years, it has generally been thought that monetary policy should limit its response to or look through supply shocks to the extent that they are expected to be temporary and idiosyncratic. Many argue as well that in the future, supply disruptions are likely to be more frequent or more persistent than in the decades just before the pandemic. A second question then is what we've learned about this standard looking through approach. The idea that the response to the inflationary effects of supply shocks should be attenuated arises in part from the trade-off presented by those shocks. Supply shocks tend to move prices and employment in opposite directions whereas monetary policy pushes each in the same direction. Therefore, the response of monetary policy to higher prices stemming from an adverse supply shock should be attenuated because it would otherwise amplify the unwanted decline in employment. In addition, supply shocks have most frequently, most frequently come from the volatile food and energy categories, and they've passed through quickly. While food and energy prices critically affect the budgets of households and businesses, the policy tools of central banks work more slowly than commodity markets move. So responding aggressively to quickly passing price increases could exacerbate macroeconomic volatility without supporting price stability. Our experience since 2020 highlights some limits of this thinking. To begin with, it can be challenging to disentangle supply shocks from demand shocks in real time, and also to determine how long either will persist particularly in the extraordinary circumstances of the past three years. Supply sh shocks that have a persistent effect on potential output could call for restrictive policy to better align aggregate demand with the suppressed level of aggregate supply. The sequence of shocks to global supply chains experienced from 2020 to 22 suppressed output for a considerable time and actually may have persistently altered global supply dynamics. Such a sequence calls on policymakers to use policy restraint to limit inflationary effects. Policy restraint in this case is also good risk management. Supply shocks that drive inflation high enough for long enough can affect the longer term inflation expectations of households and businesses. Monetary policy must forthrightly address any risks of a potential de-anchoring of inflation expectations as well anchored expectations help bring inflation back to our target. 
The sharp policy tightening during 2022 likely contributed to keeping inflation expectations well anchored. My third question, then, is the level where interest rates will settle once the effects of the pandemic are truly behind us. By 2019, the general level of nominal interest rates had declined steadily over several decades. As the pandemic arrived, many advanced economies had below target inflation and low or mildly negative rates, raising difficult questions about the efficacy of interest rate policy when constrained by the effect of lower bound or the ELB, as we call it. Over two decades, an extensive literature had identified a number of possible changes to the widely used inflation targeting regime, including negative policy rates, nominal income targeting, and various forms of makeup strategies under which persistent shortfalls in inflation would be followed by a period of inflation running moder moderately above 2%. Today, inflation and policy rates are elevated and the effect of lower bound is not currently relevant for our policy decisions. But it's far too soon to say whether the monetary policy challenges of the ELB will ultimately turn out to be a thing of the past. The prolonged proximity of interest rates to the ELB was at the heart of the monetary policy review and the changes we made to our framework in 2020. We will begin our next five-year review in the latter half of 2024 and announce the results about a year later. Among the questions we will consider is the degree to which the structural features of the economy that led to low interest rates in the pre-pandemic period will persist. With time, we will continue to learn from the experience of the past few years and what implications it may hold for monetary policy. These are just, just three of the many questions raised by these challenging times. And of course, we're very far from a complete understanding of the answers. Again, it's great to be here today and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. And I think we're really off to an excellent start with, uh, with your remarks. Let me now uh, turn to Amir. Um, Amir, um, Israel is a small open economy, faces very specific challenges. Like the US and many other countries, it's seen an increase in inflation in recent years. And the Bank of Israel has been uh, uh, acting on it. In addition, like other small open economies, it faces potential spillovers from monetary policy decisions taken elsewhere by major central banks with a potential impact on, on currency and, and capital flows. And we'd love to hear reviews. So Amir, floor is yours. All right. First, it's a pleasure to be here in a conference in honor of Ken Rogoff. We all cherish and follow his distinguished contribution in academia and, and practice. Um, sort of in a sharp turn, as we're all aware, uh, Israel is currently at a war following the October 7th inhuman brutal attack by the terrorist organization of Hamas. This is crucial time for Israel's security, and we thank all those who support us. Our hearts are with the innocent victims of the war, and our hope is for it to end with the safe return of hostages and with peace and security. And now I'm going to turn out. I want to turn now to address the issues and questions presented uh, for this session. An important question is, to what extent can a small open economy like Israel, or for that matter, any SOE conduct its monetary policy independently, or should it rather follow the steps of the major economies? Another question is, what are the spillovers from the policy taken by the major econo economies to small open economies, and how do those impact local conditions? The answer to these questions depends on the development of the economy, its specific areas of exposure to the global economy, and the particular shock it might need to react to. Generally, local monetary policy cannot be entirely disconnected from that in the major economies. Yet, local circumstances justify and require setting policy that is tailored in accordance with the economy's structure and needs. Key considerations will include interest differentials, foreign exchange, and the effect on domestic activity,
in particular exports, and on inflation, and on financial markets. As we all know, our planet has become a small village. The COVID experience demonstrated the spillovers that can result from a common shock. Monetary policy was generally similar in many countries because the initial health shocks, as well as many supply side difficulties, were similar. Also, we benefited to some extent or from the common monetary framework, such as inflation targeting. And that meant that monetary policy in different economies was predicted to act in a similar manner. Having said that, the differential health shock and related steps, fiscal policy differences, and exposure to supply side effects and commodity prices led to somewhat different policies, consequent inflation, and activity outcomes. Consequently, there was more heterogeneity in monetary policy exiting COVID than upon its entry. Israel was fortunate in that sense with relatively small share of tourism sector and a relatively large high-tech sector, which actually benefited from the increased dependency on remote work. These circumstances led to a wedge between global monetary policy and the required domestic monetary policy. This slide shows that for these reasons and others, inflation in Israel is in the lowest quartile of rates in the OECD. In particular, headline inflation in Israel was low because its natural gas supply and prices were shielded from global developments. The next slide shows the swift recovery of the Israeli economy from the COVID crisis. The level of GDP exceeded its long run trend already by the end of 21 and stayed somewhat above this trend by Q3 23. And we'll come back to this recovery ability of the Israeli economy. An additional key attribute in Israel that affects potency and effectiveness of monetary policy is the large share of mortgages that are directly tied to the Bank of Israel. Therefore, raising rates influences the stock of almost all homeowners, not just new ones. This is another cause for possible differences between global and local monetary policy decisions. The Bank of Israel was one of the first central banks to respond to the increase in inflation. As a first step, we shrank the unconventional tools employed during COVID, that is QE, FX intervention, and special funding to commercial banks. Relative to its rate of inflation, Israel has been among the first movers. This is another evidence for only partial dependence of SOE on policy taken by major central banks. Here you could see the uh, relative time it took to get into a restrictive zone. The policy the Bank of Israel has in fact set in recent years is consistent with this approach. We are aware of the fact that domestic monetary policy cannot deviate too much from global conditions, but at the same time, we recognize that policy should be set according to specific shocks to our economy, taking into account its fundamental attributes. And you could see over different, some cycles are shared and some are not. Let me show you some specific shocks. We learned over the years that there is a strong connection between the S&P and NASDAQ indices and the shekel dollar exchange rate. This is because Israeli institutional investors react continuously to changes in the value of their foreign denominated portfolio. This slide shows this pattern very clearly. The orange tr tracks the blue. However, as can easily be seen since the beginning of 23, this, co this strong connection has weakened. This was the time period that potential changes to the judicial system ignited a widespread civilian opposition. Similarly, the, U the Israeli and US, U.S. stock markets who tend to move together also displayed the weakened connection. According to the assessment done at the bank, if the exchange rate were to follow the NASDAQ in the way the pattern with the NASDAQ index, according to the previous uh, periods, the shekel would have been about 15% stronger relative to the actual foreign exchange rate in September 23. You see it in the gap at the end. Given our estimates of the foreign exchange path route, 
pass-through to inflation, this amounts to about 1 to 1.5% 1 additional inflation. This demonstrates, again, the power of local significant developments that might have on financial markets, on inflation, and therefore on policy. I want now to move and discuss current developments in relation to monetary policy. An important part in the analysis is, of course, the initial conditions. The Israeli economy is strong and stable. It has robust and healthy economic foundations. We are a global leader in innovation and technology. The Israeli economy has known how to function and to recover from difficult periods in the past and to return to prosperity rapidly. I have no doubt that the same will be the case this time. You could see the growth rate after different military events in the past. Importantly, over the years, Israel has shown responsible fiscal position as demonstrated by the declining path of the debt to GDP ratio. Israel entered the war with a very solid fiscal stand. Our debt to GDP ratio is just under 60% and a budget deficit which was expected to be 1.5% in 23, following a surplus in 22. There is no doubt the war will have fiscal implications and generate budget pressures. According to initial projections of our research department, which of course, and I cannot emphasize this enough, are accompanied by extreme uncertainty. And assuming the war is primarily concentrated in the southern border and lasts till the end of this year, GDP growth is likely to shrink by about 1% in 23 and 24, and the debt to GDP ratio is likely to rise to somewhat more than 65% by the end of 24, as costs are larger than it was initially projected. As I mentioned in my opening, uh, Israel has been in a war for a month now. Above and beyond the vast human security and political consequences, there is no doubt this is a major shock to the economy, to households, workers, and businesses. Economic policy, fiscal, and monetary, which we in the BOI lead, takes the necessary actions in order to alleviate the difficulties accompanying these challenging times. With the outbreak of fighting, significant depreciation pressures were seen, which were reflected in early trading in foreign markets. The Bank of Israel responded rapidly. Already on October 9th, before trading opened, we implemented a plan to sell up to $30 billion of reserves and to put into operation swap transactions totaling up to $15 billion. Within the framework of the program, the bank is acting in the market to moderate the fluctuations in the value of the shekel and to supply the liquidity required to continue the orderly activity of the markets. The initial high level of the Bank of Israel's foreign exchange reserves at about $200 billion, 40% of GDP, gives us ample space to act to achieve this target. In addition, the bank also put into operation a shekel repo transaction plan and a monetary program fo focused on small businesses. In parallel, and that's the other side to the approach, from the beginning of the war, the Bank of Israel rapidly formulated a uniform and agreed upon framework that was adopted by the commercial banks and was expanded to credit card companies as well. The framework is focused on those serving in the army reserves, the population of, on the borders, and the families of the victims and hostages. These populations will be able to defer for three months payments on mortgages, consumer credit, and small business credit without cost. Many of the banks have extended these steps, a very welcomed outcome, as they are stable, resilient, and have ample capital buffers. In our interest rate meeting on October 23rd, we kept the policy rate at 475. This is consistent with the bank foreign exchange activities and inflation endeavors. This array of policy steps that were taken by the bank in the last month reveals the sufficient and necessary independence that the bank enjoys and that it has the adequate set of monetary tools that can ensure financial stability. Avoiding a reduction in the rates is in line with operating in the FX market to moderate large depreciation fluctuations. Moreover, the steps taken by the bank vis-a-vis -vis the banking sector allow in practice some monetary easing, but targeted 
at those who need it most, without compromising the need to deal with increased risk premia in financial market. Let me say, one month in, we can cautiously say that the policy mix we applied contributed to the stability not only of the FX market, but also had positive spillovers for the stability of local financial markets. The developments in the markets also indicate that the public understands that the BOI enjoys the required independence in order to take the necessary steps at these times. Inflation expectations, as you can see in the slides, for the short term and the long terms have remained substantially stable and are, target and are stating that we will be back in the inflation target. The exchange rate has depreciated a lot but by now is back to the level prior to the war. Let me, uh, so you could see the red line, this depreciated more than previous military events, but it's now back to where it was. Fiscal, let me finish here. Fiscal policy is of course central and crucial for the ability of the economy to overcome this crisis and to resume growth in the medium and long term. The government is working on various fiscal support plans, which the bank is playing a key role in advising in its role as economic advisor to the government. The bank has stated the importance of finding a responsible ba balance between supporting the economy and maintaining a sound fiscal position. While it is clear that overall fiscal needs will increase, the bank advice is and was to utilize the 23 budget, yet demonstrate fiscal responsibility by introducing several important adjustments and cuts in less necessary activities in 23 and 24 budgets. I'll finish here. I have no doubt that as always, Israel will prevail and has the right ingredients to spring back to its great economic potential. We all hope for calmer and more tranquil times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amir. Um, we will now move um, to Gita. Now, of course, in light of what both Jay and Amir have told us, I think uh, the question in front of us uh, at the fund is, you know, how to think about the challenges for central, central banks and whether central banks have the appropriate toolkit uh, at the current juncture. And I think everyone will be uh, very grateful to hear your views, Gita. Thank you uh, so much. And firstly, uh, as a former student and colleague of Ken, I'm really glad that we were able to honor Ken Rogoff's tremendous contributions to academia and to the policy world through this conference. So uh, as Pierre Olivier said, what I'm gonna talk about is some of the challenges that monetary policy making faces in this current inflation environment. I think it's fair to say that we are living through a period of heightened uncertainty. We know that there are multiple shocks that the world has faced and unprecedented shocks, the pandemic, wars, conflicts. The uncertainty that I want to emphasize though here is about how the current episode of monetary policy tightening has not been your typical monetary policy tightening episode. And that generates its own source of uncertainty about how to go ahead. So what exactly do I mean by that? So yes, we have had inflation go up quite dramatically in many parts of the world. And central banks have appropriately raised interest rates quite sizably uh, in this last year and a half, couple of years. And we've seen inflation decline. All of this is standard. But if you look at, if you look under the hood, I think what is highly atypical is that this decline in inflation has not come along with a rising rate of unemployment, a significantly increase in the unemployment rate or a significant slack in the labor market. This is atypical, because usually the way we think of policy affecting inflation, is reducing aggregate demand, and then that shows up in 
the labor market through higher unemployment. Now, this is true if you look at the US, you look at the euro area, UK, but also several emerging markets, uh, including Mexico, if you look at emerging Europe, and several others. So what has helped? What has, what, uh, how have we gotten a bunch of this inflation decline? Much of the work has been done by improved supply. And here, I'm talking about the decline in energy prices and food prices that have helped bring down headline inflation. The improvement in global supply chains have helped bring down core goods inflation. The business that's still left is when you look at services inflation, where variables like wage growth play a very important role. And core services inflation, or more services inflation more generally, remains elevated. So in that sense, the job is not done. Uh, but this can be tricky in terms of communication, because on one hand, you see inflation all headed in the right direction. Uh, but at the, on the other hand, you realize that this last mile will likely be the toughest. So if you look at measures of core services of inflation, let me just give you a couple of numbers. The US is now at 5%. The euro area is at 4.5%. These numbers are well above central bank targets. OK, so what does that mean in terms of uh, policy going forward? The first point that I'm going to make is that that means that it's important to avoid premature easing of monetary policy, either through action or through words. Now, this is going to be a challenge because we are living in a, in a difficult uh, period in terms of reading the signals. We are going to see labor markets uh, have greater slack. We are going to see unemployment rates go up. So that's going to be a difficult message to stand by and say that, well, we have to make sure that we get the job done. The other reason this is going to be a challenge is because we have lived through a period of inflation that's been high, and the persistence of inflation makes it more difficult to then see through supply shocks, something, something that Jay mentioned, which is that we still live in this environment where there are numerous uh, potential shocks that can hit the world economy, including the terrible conflict that's in the Middle East that Amir talked about. If it were to spread into a more regional conflict, we could see a sharp increase in oil prices. That will then affect headline inflation numbers. And in an environment where inflation has been high for a while, that can dislodge short-term inflation expectations. And our research has shown uh, that it's very important what, what's happening with short-term inflation expectations. Because if you can keep that close to your target, then that makes the job of central bankers much easier in being able to bring down inflation while at the same time uh, not needing a big loss in terms of output. So the, it improves the odds of a soft landing. The other challenge that comes up is what's happening with long-term rates. We've seen long-term rates in the US uh, go up quite significantly in the last uh, 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 several weeks. It's bounced around a bit, but still these are much higher numbers in the past than in the past. So this raises a question, which as a policymaker, does this mean that then you can, that you don't have to do the next interest rate hike, if that's what you were thinking about doing? Because now you're getting the effect uh, that's working through higher long-term rates. And here again, this is tricky given the uncertainty. So let me just explain which is it depends a whole lot on what's driving the higher long-term rates. If the higher long-term rates are being driven by expansionary fiscal policy, then, in fact, a higher long-term rate should actually signal a need for even more monetary policy tightening to offset the expansionary effect that it's having on the economy. Uh, in the US, where you're seeing most of these interest rate increases, the US deficit, fiscal deficit, is around 8% this year, and it's projected to be around 7% over the next three years. Now, there is a question mark of how stimulative that is on the economy, but with, when you have high levels of deficits, that certainly 
is something for, um, for a central banker to also uh, incorporate when they're trying to make their forecasts about the path of inflation. My second point about what it means for policymaking in this environment is that central banks must be prepared to respond to renewed financial stresses, especially if inflationary pressures persist. So again, there is the last mile that has to be done, but if inflation remains far more stubborn or further go it goes up in some more because of other shocks, then that will require interest rates to stay even higher for longer or even increase. And we could be then in a situation where you have an inflation problem while at the same time growth is slowing sharply. So that's a stagflationary environment that one could have and one certainly should not rule that out. In that scenario, again, some of our research has shown that we would have a large number of weak banks that represent about one third of global assets, mostly located in advanced economies uh, and in China. That would, be a, that would be a very difficult place to be in, which is why it's important to prepare in advance. This is the time for strong supervision, robust stress tests, and it's also important for banks to be able to augment their capital buffers at a time when they're making currently very high profits. Banks should also be prepared to quickly access central bank facilities if needed so that we don't have a repeat of an SVB phenomenon. And much more efforts need to be made to address the, ris the risks in the non-bank sector. The third uh, point I'd like to make about policy in the current uh, junction, juncture is that policymakers have to be prepared for more cross-border pressures from increased divergence across economies, increased divergence in policies across economies. So let me give you an example. If you, in, if you compare 10-year yields in China in its own currency to 10-year yields on US treasuries, for the first time, it's, the numbers have flipped around. So we actually have uh, yields in China treasuries, 10-year treasuries are now around slightly less than about close to 2% lower than the yield that you can get uh, on US treasuries. Now, that obviously puts lots of pressure on exchange rates. And so I'm gonna conclude with a few thoughts on what it means for a central banker, especially of a smaller open economy that's facing pressure from weakening currencies in this environment where yields I could look very different uh, I for a while. Moving. I this is based, by the way, on the a lot world, of research you know, that we've been doing at in the fund. It's called a lot of integrated gyan, policy framework. Execution, okay, so first, uh, what does this mean for and you can uh, exchange rate and interventions? I think the important thing for central bankers to keep in mind is first that the exchange rate movement is being driven a lot by fundamental shocks. So it is being driven to an important extent by interest rate differentials which means that in such an environment, exchange rate flexibility has a very important role to play and it helps you with uh, adjusting. But of course, on the other hand, what can happen is in an environment of heightened uncertainty, you could see exchange rate movements entering zones that then pose a risk in terms of financial stability concerns, especially if you have shallow FX markets. And there's also this risk, which I often hear, that you might have exchange rates going past some psychological thresholds, which then can lead to non-fundamental behavior uh, in these markets. So in this environment, of course, in these specific cases, uh, FX intervention can play a useful role. But this is gonna require judgment, and this is the hard part, which is telling apart when is it truly fundamental and when is it non-fundamental for which intervention should happen. I think the basic uh, policy has to be not that the only thing that matters is if you see a sharp movement in the exchange rate. A sharp movement of the exchange rate can truly reflect differences in fundamentals. But it has to be a sharp movement in exchange rate that then interacts with some friction in the economy. Uh, and you can, be, you, should be able to, you can see that through, say, deviations in uncovered interest parity or covered interest parity that then tells you that 
the shock is getting amplified through uh, frictions, for which you certainly interventions can help. The sec and the last bit uh, on FX policy is just to remember that there is no free lunch. Countries have a certain amount of FX reserves. If you use it, deploy it uh, at a time when it's not really needed and prematurely, then that, of course, means that you're going to have less to use uh, when you are in a more nice difficult period. So with that, I have 30 seconds just to conclude and just to remind everybody in terms of the three points I made, which is firstly, the job of bringing down inflation is not done in many countries, and that requires that you to avoid premature easing of monetary policy, either through action or through how you communicate. Uh, second, it's important to for central banks to be prepared to respond to renewed financial to stresses spin, and also to buffer the financial system. Retail, aid, financial and third, for policymakers to be prepared for more cross-border pressures ago, the free world, because of increasing divergence of the, the policy of the stances internet. across economies. The no, internet is a there. platform Thank you. where out of 8 billion people on the planet, 5.5 billion people. Thank you. Thank you, Gita. Um, and I will now turn uh, to Ken. Now, of course, Ken, your own work, uh, both uh, when you were in policy but as an academic over many, many years, you've touched on all of these issues. Um, and I think, you know, as many people have mentioned already today, your both sets of contributions, academic and policy, completely irrigate our own thinking on, on these matters. And so I think um, we're very eager to, um, to hear your views on all this. <clears throat> so first, I want to thank the IMF uh, for hosting this conference, and particularly this panel, Pierre Olivier, Amir, uh, Jay, and Gita, uh, for participating. Uh, uh, Jay, I certainly appreciate how valuable your time is. And Amir, I don't know how you found time uh, to come here. Uh, but thank you. Um, it is an extraordinarily difficult period and in terms of shocks. And I know when you're giving the World Economic Outlook, uh, Pierre Levé would probably always say that. But one of the things here, celebrating my 70 years, I've been around the block. And it's, this is pretty bad. I mean, I think you'd have to go back to the 70s to think about a period that really compares to this. And it, even if you don't encompass the global financial crisis, but just have the pandemic, and I don't know how to say this, you know, apolitically, but the rather radical shifts in US policy from one president to the next, uh, and the various implications of that. Uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, war uh, in Ukraine, now war in the Middle East, uh, and uh, this really uh, fragmentation of globalization uh, is really something uh, extraordinary and is a very difficult period. I think that has implications for a lot of things, for policy, for macroeconomics. However, before I get into that, I, I want to say, I can think of, there is sort of one silver lining, and I must hesitate to say it because if I'm identifying something the IMF seems to have done right, then it may immediately go wrong. But um, <laughs> the, uh, I, you know, the thing uh, that has surprised me, and it surprised me a lot, is how we've had the pandemic, global recession, rising interest rates, inflation, and we have not had a major emerging market debt crisis. I Forgive me, Argentina. Um, uh, we, we just haven't had it the way that we thought we would. You can go on to other markets. It's really uh, stunning. And, uh, you know, again, the, the, you know, we don't know whether it's around the corner. But I, I actually would give uh, the IMF a little credit here. Uh, and there was all this, uh, for years, talk about the Washington consensus and the evils of the Washington consensus. And you may not have followed it, but there were many alternatives, <clears throat> notably the Buenos Aires consensus between the presidents of uh, Venezuela, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, back in the early 2000s and much praised by many uh, 
progressive economists. And uh, without going into the details, I would say the way people characterized the Washington Consensus was something of a caricature. It wasn't, you know, it's sort of picking extreme versions of each policy. And yet, if we look at why haven't emerging markets had a uh, financial crisis, it's in a sense they've adopted, at least in the macro sphere, and probably particularly in the central banking sphere, uh, some version of the Washington Consensus. Now, one was to have a lot of reserves. That's really not in the Washington Consensus, and the Japan and the Asian economies deserve credit for that. Uh, and now everyone's imitated that, that in a dollarized world, it provides a lot of resilience. But there are certainly other elements. Uh, regulation's gotten a lot better. And uh, I have to say, whenever I had to sit in on meetings about regulation when I was IMF chief economist, I, I was sort of bored uh, by them. <laughs> but you know, actually, it's one of those things where you do your homework and it really pays off, for example, matching forcing banks and emerging markets to match their dollar assets and liabilities, uh, something really important. And not, not just that, but the knowledge that many uh, emerging market central banks have about what's going on in their economies, the data that they keep track of. Uh, certainly central bank independence, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute much more, uh, that's been an extraordinary development and allowed many of these things uh, uh, to, to persist. So um, anyway, that, that has been uh, a silver lining in a very difficult uh, situation. So I'm going to pick up on a couple topics. I want to start with uh, interest rates. And I'm not going to talk about policy, but just talk about where, where, where do we think long-term interest rates are going. Uh, I think, like any financial variable, it's actually very hard to know. Uh, but I think if you take uh, a very long-term view of long-term real interest rates. And I gave a paper at this conference last year about it and I've done other work with uh, Barbara Rossi and Paul Schmelzing. Um, you, you see that over the long run, there is a very gentle decline, but it's much more gentle than we've seen over the last 40 years. And there's been uh, sort of a lot of work trying to rationalize what happened over the last 40 years in terms of demographics, uh, productivity, secular stagnation, that I, I have always submitted has been overblown. And if you look at these longer periods, it's just you know some of what seems like a structural change is just another kind of big shock that comes along. We've had periods where interest rates have been low, periods where real interest rates have been high around this trend. And typically, when you see a really big shock, First, like after 2008, where uh, global rates fell, uh, you know, by some measures, uh, up to global 10-year uh, inflation index rates over 3%, uh, you should never have expected that to be permanent. And of course, the same might have been true how much it rises here. It's difficult to tie the trend exactly. But it, what is certainly true is long-term rates typically are very volatile. That was somewhat masked during, I think, this period, particularly of the zero bound, which uh, the chair of the Fed has talked about, where the central banks just couldn't do anything. And that provided, I think, took, uh, took away some of the volatility. Uh, I, I, my, my own uh, guess is that we'll be looking at significantly higher interest rates, certainly at least like they were a year ago. And I'm talking about forward-looking real interest rates and perhaps higher for the rest of the decade or more. Again, there's volatility around this. And I'm talking about the long rate, not the short rate. Um, and yeah, I, th I think there are many reasons for this. But one is deglobalization uh, is probably puts upward pressure and fragmentation on uh, interest rates, both in terms of risk premia uh, and in terms of uh, where savings goes. Uh, another, another thing I have to say, unfortunately, is there's, uh, in addition to the green transition, we are looking at a decade, two decades of much higher spending on defense globally. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd, I've been to conferences at the IMF uh, 
not so long ago, uh, and Olivier knows this, not him, not him as a speaker, but we were jointly organizing one where one of the speakers insisted, well, we never have to spend anything on defense again. So, uh, you know, the interest rates are low, everything's a free lunch, uh, and we should uh, take advantage of that. I, un, un, unfortunately, that was very sanguine, and uh, we're in a more difficult uh, period there. I've mentioned the green transition. Uh, inequality is something which has put probably downward pressure on interest rates, but there are strong pressures in the other direction. Let me say a few words about central bank independence, which I think uh, it has been uh, in, in incredibly important to maintaining stability that we have. And it's something that's become very important uh, worldwide. I have to mention when I was at the IMF as a very junior economist, I don't know what it's like now, but you were only allowed one chair in your office for you, because who would want to visit you? That was what people, <laughs> that was what people said. Uh, but I, I wrote a paper uh, inspired by Paul Volcker on uh, how, how uh, central bank independence might um, help with the inflation problem of the day. And I wrote about the original title, title of the paper had inflation targeting in it, but it has inflation targeting in it and uh, looks at uh, intermediate targets. Uh, and uh, I, I will finally uh, also say that I mentioned this morning about how hard it is to get papers published when you're junior. I couldn't get this one published. I su submitted it. Uh, one place I sent it was to the JP, where Barrow sent it back by return mail, saying, look, there's not going to be an institutional solution to this problem. Uh, it's a super, super game. I got it rejected by IMF staff papers at the time. <laughs> um, but I, I think, uh, I think it's, it's certainly something where uh, you know, it's become uh, very successful. Um, I, I, I will say that. Um, you know, in sort of trying to apply it, you have to have some humility. Uh, you can't think there's some rule that just explains everything, your inflation targeting rule, the world changes. And models, let's face it, are particularly bad at turning points. If your model's predicting that tomorrow's gonna be sort of like today, we do really well at that in those models. <laughs> But, and they can, you can, they're very complicated versions of that, but they're all the same. But when you have, when you have a big turning point, and we might have a turning point now uh, because of many factors, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's more difficult. Um, so let me just talk about a few of the pressures on central bank independence uh, today. And I, it's a fast moving thing. And so I'm not even sure I'm nearly up to date. But during the zero bound era, people said, well, you don't have anything to do to central banks. So you should solve inequality. You should solve the environment. You should solve racial justice and on and on. And you can see this in central bank banker speeches. I haven't uh, checked uh, Mears or Jay's. Uh, but you can see this. They're under tremendous pressure to address these issues. And people say, well, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. But there's a question of whether they have the instruments to do that. The most, they're regulatory instruments, but they're very second order in most countries. They're, the central bank's not the only one. And the interest rate is a very uh, blunt uh, instrument. Uh, we're certainly, uh, you know, it's possible with these in inflation, having experienced inflation and these different times, it will change. Um, the, I cannot overstate these pressures that I just mentioned on central bank independence. So let me give you, uh, sort of conclude with give you a couple of data points on this. First of all, a friend of mine retired recently from being the head of research at a regional Fed, I won't name it, wasn't on the East Coast. Uh, and said, and said uh, you know, I was the last one working on monetary policy in my department. You know, we have nine or 10 people. They work on all these other issues, inequality, the environment, the weather, uh, but they're not working on monetary policy. And uh, I'm sure that's changed, but uh, I don't know. Um, and uh, the, um, 
cer certainly the other data point I would put is uh, the American Economic Association does a survey every 10 years with pretty similar questions. And okay, I don't always trust surveys, but since this one says something that I want to say, I'm going to cite it. Uh, <laughs> they, but they, you know, they poll the uh, five or 600 people at the AEA convention uh, every year. And in, uh, there were a few questions, but I'll just pick on one. Uh, in 2000, they asked, um, you know, should uh, uh, the main, uh, the, who should take the lead in uh, short-term stabilization policy, the Federal Reserve or fiscal policy? And in 2000, it was like 75, 25 monetary policy. I don't know where the 25 came from, but they had that. And then it flipped in 2020, which is really hard to get your head wrapped around when you think about how political fiscal policy, I mean, look at what's going on in the US right now. I mean, the idea that they're gonna, com they're gonna be able to perform surgery on the macro economy is uh, scary. There are lots of things fiscal policy should do when there's a big shock, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's different. Uh, I, I have to mention one other question, which I just have time for that they asked was, should the main goal of the central bank be stabilizing inflation or, and then they list uh, jobs, you know, jobs, which actually is in the mandate, but uh, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and so in, you know, in 2000, we'd still had the inflation. Inflation was the answer. Again, it was about 75, 25, and it had completely flipped that, well, don't worry about inflation, you know, by 2020. Uh, so um, I think that was before we'd hit this turning point, and uh, maybe it'll be different going forward. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ken. That was absolutely terrific, as we expected. So we've not been disappointed. There's been no turning point on that, at least. And as we've seen today, uh, there are some ways in which central banks are asked to do much more than just monetary policy. Uh, let me maybe open it up to the panelists and see if anyone wants to react to uh, the points that have been raised by others before we then take questions from, from the floor. So anyone wants to? Kita, please. Um, Amir, if I may, uh, you briefly mentioned about the use of a fixed intervention. Uh, and as you know, I said in my speaking points, that it's, it's a pretty tricky thing to tell apart when, and when to intervene and when not to. It would be great to hear from you how you think about that. I think one lesson that we learned um, through economic history is that when financial crises intermingle with real crises or other events, you can think of COVID as a health crisis, went into an economic crisis, and through a lot of the work of the Fed, we sort of averted a financial crisis. But we know those are the deepest. Those have a magnifying effect when the two interact. And that's why when this event had started, um, it was, and, and we could already see there was a lot of uh, things going on in, the, in Asia and, and other places uh, regarding the shekel. Uh, that was the logic. You want to uh, ensure stability. You want to make sure the markets function. You don't, you don't target a particular exchange rate, but you want to moderate uh, things such that uh, the markets function, there is liquidity, and that's, uh, that, that was our, our goal. And I think, you know, as of now, as I showed you, the exchange rate sort of through events, uh, obviously it's related to the events that are actually happening uh, in, in Israel as well, but it, it gave it time. It didn't drift into panic mode. And that was the role of, uh, and still is the role of FX intervention when you have risk premia go up. That's the number one concern. There are, there's, there are people, when it happened, immediately say you should, you should lower interest rates, uh, help the economy. No. The two go hand in hand together. The idea was to stabilize the exchange rate. The exchange rate uh, stability had periphery effects on the bond market and the stock market in Israel. They continue all to function. We came with the other prong approach with the targeted things for the households.
and that was the way uh, we sort of aimed at it. So if I can, and in the meantime, if you are planning to ask a question, I will ask you to go and uh, put yourself uh, behind one of the mics so we can directly move to the questions afterwards. But before we turn to that, let me actually follow up with one question for, I mean, Amir and, and, and Jay. Um, I mean, Jay, I mean, it, it, there's this incredible resilience in the U.S. economy is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gita mentioned we've had this decline in inflation and the economy uh, seems to be powering ahead. Growth is, is really at a very high level. Consumption is very, very strong. Um, there's this question about whether transmission of monetary policy is different this time around. Now, you've, in your remarks, you've alluded to the fact that the sequence of shocks we've had is quite different from the typical business cycle. Or, um, and so I was curious, and I would like to ask the same question to Amir, because in the context of the tightening of policy that you have done in uh, at the Bank of Israel, uh, and maybe some of these uh, resilience that Ken was talking about, building a stronger monetary policy framework, building reserves, et cetera, whether there is a sense in which the tightening operates in slightly different ways, there are longer delays, shorter delays, how, how do you view this from, uh, from your own vantage point. Go ahead. So I would say a couple things. Um, clearly, the, the U.S. economy has been stronger than expected. It's been more resilient. And uh, this year is just remarkable, really. You know, so many uh, forecasters had, an, had a recession this year, and it's nothing like that. It's going to be close to 2.5% growth this year. But that's, that's really, that's probably, in my thinking, probably a significantly a function of strong demand. I, th I think monetary policy is generally working in the ways that we think it's, it should work, which is interest-sensitive spending, asset prices, exchange rate. Um, I think there are some aspects of the U.S. economy where you can argue that it's a little different, and that would be, for example, uh, households who, who are in low-rate mortgages are, are not selling their homes, but they're also not, they're not feeling the effects of higher rates because they, they really don't want to get out of those mortgages. Same thing with companies, uh, any company that had access to fixed rate borrowing and didn't use that uh, in the last three or four years would be facing, but there, there are very few companies that are in that. So it may be that the U.S. economy is, is structurally a little bit more resilient to, to interest rates, but I don't think that there's, I, I don't see at this point any, um, anything that seems to be structurally or materially in, in, the, in the nature of a difference. Amir. I, I sort of agree with Jay. I think the famous long lead, you know, lags, uh, it may be a bit longer. Partly people came out of COVID with a lot of savings. So the potency and the effect of monetary policy uh, took longer, the adjustments of both supply and demand. But I think at least Israel also had, as I shown, a, a very strong recovery and we are still above uh, trend, but we're slowing down. So the effect of monetary policy uh, was was kicking in before uh, this whole event. Inflation was on probably on its way to its to our target in Q1 uh, 24. It just took, in my opinion, a little bit longer for these adjustments uh, to happen. Uh, I also agree with Jay in his in his speech that the issue of supply to look through supply was um, there's a time to do that but once inflation gets too high and too long the expectation channel is so important and as long as that was anchored in monetary policy uh, ultimately would kick in it yeah it did take a, uh, a little bit longer okay I just want to, for a second, uh, go back to something that Ken talked about, which is central bank independence. Unsurprisingly, I'm, I'm a believer in central bank independence. <laughs> um, but it, it really is just an institutional arrangement that exists uh, because the elected government allows it to exist. And as long as it serves the public well, it, it's, it's a fine institutional arrangement. And I, I think it's, um, it's easy to forget that you know, we, we have this precious independence. It should be very, very rare in a functioning democracy that you have an institution that has d the degree of independence that we have. Of course, we, stri we strive all the time to be democratically accountable and transparent. But I think that the temptation to wander into exciting new issues that really are the business of the elected government uh, 
is, is a strong one and is to be resisted. And I, because I think that's, when I think of ways that, that, that uh, uh, independence could, could be undermined, to me, that's, that's right at the top of the list. Very good. Any other reactions or comments? Well, I, I mean, I, I would just add to what Jay just said. I mean, I think many economists, particularly over the last 15 or 20 years, just take it for granted, and they have these very sterile technocratic models and don't realize that central bank independence is something central bankers have to fight for every day. I mean, it's a very political environment with which they have to protect their, uh, their right to do monetary policy independently. Very good. So let me, with this, let me open it up to the floor. So I'm going to start with Martin here. Please state your name and your affiliation, and then, uh, then I'll move back and we'll, we'll alternate. So Martin, you go first. So Martin Stürmer with the research department here at the IMF. Governor Yaron, thank you so much for joining us during these terrible times. I hope that you can live in peace very soon. Um, now, what are the scenarios that you are preparing for? What are the kind of the worst case scenarios that you're thinking about? The projections that we gave, as I mentioned, were um, contained to a situation where most of the uh, war is really at the southern border. It takes until the end of 2023. It doesn't mean there's no interactions in the war in, in the north, but it, there isn't a full-fledged uh, transition into a war there. That's a different ball game. It will have a different impact. Um, there's enough uncertainties even around just the issues of the southern border, uh, just dealing with the southern border, how um, things, how comfortable people will be coming back to some of the activities around there. Um, the north border will be, if that happens, and we all hope. Uh, that doesn't happen. This, this could have a uh, much bigger implication. Be, um, is, is, is just a different scenario altogether. Thank you. I'm going to go to the back, the lady over there. It should be working. Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm an economist here at the IMF. Um, my question would be to Mr. Powell. Uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on a uh, subject that Gita touched upon, which, which is the mo recent movements in the yield curve in these last many weeks. And I wanted to know if you think it's a change in natural rates, so maybe Fed, Fed funds rates should be a bit higher or this is just a steeper uh, yield curve, like higher term pre premium, so maybe Fed funds rates could be lower. And also I would like, to, I'm, I'm a bit worried about uh, over tightening on a personal level, of course. <laughs> 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 so what would be clear evidence for you that rates are uh, in restrictive uh, territory en enough, uh, given the lags, I mean, uh, we could be over tightening. That's it. Thank you. So um, on your first question, um, on the implications of, of higher rates, it's um, uh, w when we move uh, the federal funds rate around, the real, the real point is to affect broader financial conditions. And broader financial conditions then, then affect the, the economy, the real economy, in ways that we broadly understand. But um, so we don't target any one financial condition. We look at, so we look at broader financial conditions. So it's very hard to draw a direct line from one particular thing like higher bond yields to what monetary policy should do. So, but, so the first thing you would look at though is you'd look for persistent changes. Even then, and so then the question is, and, and Gita touched on this appropriately, which is why, why are, are longer run, longer run rates going up, and it really, the, the, you know, the, the reason they're going up really matters, so we have to factor that in. So it's something we're looking at. It, we don't, we're certainly not going to ignore a significant tightening in financial conditions through that channel, but we don't have to decide, you know, the, we, we've, uh, we're, we're, we're moving carefully now. We've moved very fast, and, and rates are now restrictive, and so we're, we're, we're going to be looking at this question and uh, not something we're trying to make a, um, uh, 
a decision on right now. In terms of, you know, has the new, the, I take your question to be, wh why are long rates higher? I think there are many candidate explanations and five or six of them, it's easy to get to a half dozen explanations. I think we really don't know. Uh, I think one thing to point out though is people are experiencing, this is, these higher rates are actually affecting people's mortgages, the costs of their, of all their floating rate debt is, is being affected. So it's having an effect on the economy. Um, you know that the standard thinking has been that this was largely about term premium. Then the question is why term premium? I, I don't wanna try to get, dive into all of that today, but it's something we're looking at carefully and, uh, and just seeing. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, you mentioned over tightening, but how, how are we thinking? So um, I would just go back at, at the beginning, uh, really the question was to move as fast as we could. As I went through with the, the, the chronology, uh, in early 2022, it became obvious that we, you know, we needed to tighten policy as quickly as we could as, and also in, at a reasonable pace. So, so we did, and that was the main thing was speed. The second question was gonna be how high to go. And we're still on that question. You know, we're still on the question of, 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 of a policy stance that's sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. The next question will be how long to keep rates restrictive. And so we're looking at, you know, it, it, there is no magic to it. We're looking at uh, the incoming data, of course, but really we're looking at the implications for the outlook. It's really the, what, what are we learning about the outlook, the balance of risks, and all those things. And we're trying to make a judgment at this point whether we, whether we need to do more. And as I said, we, we did move very quickly. The, the speed is no longer you know, the main thing. The main thing now is to, is to try to get to that, get to that right level. Uh, of course, we don't want to go too far. But um, at the same time, we know the, the biggest mistake we could make would be to really to fail to get inflation under control. So that's not going to happen. We're, you know, we, we will keep at this in, in, until, we're, until we succeed. So moving carefully and, uh, and, and looking at all the evidence and trying to make uh, uh, smart decisions on behalf of the public. Let's go in the front here, sir. Thank you. I'm Charlie Kimball with the Korea Center for International Finance. Uh, both in the United States and presumably in Israel, um, in 2020, fiscal policy and monetary policy were in line. And now they seem to be at cross purposes. That is, we have very easy fiscal policy here and presumably in Israel. Does that mean that the real rate of interest that you should aim for should be a little higher? Amir? Amir, do you want to go first? Um, <laughs> I, I, I think this situation, uh, I'm not sure this, the, you know, we're in different situation right now in the U.S. So I think, uh, you know, the job of the government in this kind of an emergency war situation is to supply the needs uh, uh, of many of the people who, who, who've gotten hurt from the, from, from, from the war and um, to try to minimize as much the damage that might be from, uh, from, 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 this, from this event. And that require fiscal spending. There's also, obviously, as Ken mentioned, there's likely to be more military spending over, over time. Um, and the point that I was alluding to was that we need to find the right balance where on the one hand, these spending must be spending be done and at the same time go and very carefully find less uh, needed or especially given the circumstances, items in the budget uh, and tr direct them into those uh, spending avenues such that the fiscal stand over time and we've had a very, we've demonstrated very responsible fiscal uh, position and I believe that if we do that, while the debt to GDP of Israel will go up f for a while, the fiscal position uh, will retrieve back and fundamentally uh, can avoid uh, structurally uh, changing. But that require to do these uh, appropriate adjustments uh, over time uh, that I mentioned. So, um, 
First, the thing to say is that you know we we stay very far away from commenting on fiscal policy, even indirectly. So, I, I won't do that. Um, but I will say the the way we're the way I'm thinking about this is we're looking. Let's look at where real rates are. So the federal funds rates at 5.3 and change. If you look, take a one year forward look at inflation, maybe that's three. So you've got you've got real rates that are above 2%, and that's that's well above most mainstream estimates of where real of where you know, the neutral rate might be. I think it's, I think that, you know, our star is, is as a, as a, not a particularly useful way to think about uh, policy because it can be affected by so many things and it changes over the short run and the long run. So I, th I think, I, I tend to look at it that we're, we're, we're in the range, we're in the place where we have restrictive policy and probably significantly restrictive policy and we're watching the effect carefully on the economy. I think the question of, you know, has the neutral rate risen or will it rise? And, and will that be because of this factor or that factor is, is less in interesting given, given the policy job that we have to do. Of course, we have all the models and we, and we, we look at them and things like that. But really, I think about it as a, in a more practical way. Final question, sir. Um, Dr. Mamaduba from Howard University and Athletic International University in Hawaii. Uh, actually, the biggest problem in the world economy is uh, inflation. Why the Fed did not change its fundamental goal from unemployment to inflation? Uh, if you understand. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, uh, actually the fundamental goal, uh, the biggest problem in the world economy is inflation. Why the Fed, the Fed, the, your your bank, uh, did not change its fundamental goal from unemployment to inflation like the ECB? Great, thank you. So we have a congressionally set mandate of, of um, maximum employment and price stability, and those two uh, goals are equal under the law, and we can't we can't change them. Only Congress can do that. We do have a provision. Uh, the question is, um, what if one of those? What if we're very far from one of those goals? And not so far from the other. And what we do is we we when we say this in in our in our constitutional document that we've written. It's not a matter of law, but it's our policy would be to focus on the one where we're farther away from the actual goal. So two percent inflation, we were a year or so ago very far from two percent inflation, and that has been our focus. As inflation comes back down, uh, it becomes it becomes more of, a, of an equal weighting thing. And when you're equally far away from each goal then the two are equal because they are exactly equal under the law. Thank you. So I want to uh, thank our panelists, but I would like to give a chance to Ken to maybe have a final word since, uh, you know, this is, uh, this whole thing is for you. So <laughs> I think people were pretty interested in hearing everybody else uh, on this particular panel. Uh, <clears throat> I will say on this last question about uh, fiscal dominance. It's a very different thing uh, when you're at war and fiscal spending's taking up, I don't know the number, but half of GDP suddenly. Defense spending's taking up half of GDP suddenly. And there, there's no country which, you know, you know, looks at its inflation targeting framework exactly there. Nobody does that. The, I, I don't think anyone fully did that even in the pandemic. You don't have to comment, but I mean, that had a certain war-like feel at the beginning. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very diff uh, different situation where you uh, really need to reach into the toolkit because the national objectives are now you know, very different than just unemployment and inflation. So please join me and let's thank all our panelists today.